وقال الشيخ عبد الله اليونيني أن الشيخ عبد الله اليونيني said ما أعتقد أن شخصا مما رأيته حصل له من الكمال في العلوم والصفات الحميدة التي يحصل بها الكمال السواء I don't think that there's an, a single individual that I've seen that has attained the rank of completion in the sciences, noble attributes, adab and akhlaq and other affairs that leads to their completion as a human being besides him. فَإِنَّهُ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ كَانَ كَامِلًا فِي صُورَتِهِ وَمَعْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحَسْنِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ Indeed, he, may Allah have mercy upon him, was complete in his form. This means in his character as well as in ihsan. Mm. In his magnanimity and his benevolence. His leadership skills. The different sciences. Noble behaviors, characters, and manners. And in affairs which I've not seen complete in anyone besides him. Mm. And I've seen the nobility of his manners and how he lived with other people and treated them well and the overwhelming benevolence and the abundance of his knowledge and his scintillating brilliance and the completion of his manliness because in the revealed law there's certain things that are also referred to as manliness mm -hmm. right so there's a code of manliness which is known as muru'ah Mm -hmm. And there's things that manly people don't do, right? Oh. And so he possesses all these uh, characteristics of manliness. And also his abundant shyness. And he was always cheerful. So he wasn't a, a gloomy, dreary person. Mm -hmm. And he was always happy. And he kept himself aloof. From the earthly life and the people of it, and the means that lead to that, and the other things that lead to it. Uh, because there's no one that was like that, that incapacitated him, except that he was from the high ranking of the awliya. Indeed, the Messenger of Allah said, because there's no greater favor that Allah bestows on his slave, more virtuous than that he makes him remember him and engage in his remembrance and other people engage in, and other people to remember him when he's remembering him as well. And this is established right here. This is what Sheikh Ali Yunini is still saying. This establishes right here that dhikr is more noble than karamat, wonders. And this is, now this is important for the soul of purposes. Mm -hmm. Because if you find people that keep putting all this emphasis on karamat, that's, that's a sign of either right. that person, the person, the fake, uh, well, he is he's spreading his own fake karamat or other people are, mis they're, they're, they're misguided because they're, they're losing the purpose. And the best of dhikr is that which Someone does dhikr of Allah and then he discharges service to the people. And that discharging of service is teaching knowledge and the sunnah. And what's greater than that noble? And what comes next in greatness after that is showing goodness towards people by benevolence, generosity having good nature in terms of the intellect and shyness. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established him upon good manners. And he made him perfect his manners. And that caused him to, uh, that caused him to excel in the favors of Allah. And he was shown goodness in every state he was in. And he never debated with someone in the disputed matters of fiqh, except that he was smiling, mm -hmm. right? So when you, so this is permitted ikhtilaf, right? So when mm -hmm. you debate matters of fiqh, he was always smiling, right? Mm -hmm. Until someone, some people were saying, This sheikh, he kills people with a smile. Allah. 
because he was known for so when he disputed with people in fiqh and then permitted dispute dispute and uh, about the evidences he was always smiling and happy yeah? mm-hmm. and then the goes on to say qala wa qama mudda ya'mal al halaqa yawm al jum'a bi jami al dimashq and i i was resident for a period of time uh looking after the halaqa on juma at the central masjid in damascus you know that fiha ba'd as salah and there was a uh, dispute in fiqh matters after the salah thumma taraka dhalika fi akhir umrihi but near the end of his life he had to leave that wa kan yashtaghil alayhi al nas min bukrat an nar wa tifa an nahar and what would happen is the people would be busy coming to him to get their needs resolved from the early morning up until the midpoint of the day mm-hmm. right so because of that he had to leave the the fiqh issues oh. and things like that so he could look after the people and their needs because now people are coming to him scholars and other people we need your help how do we resolve this how do we resolve that thumma yaqru alayhi ba'd dhuhr then there'd be people that would recite from his kutub upon him after dhuhr imma min al-hadith aw min mustasnifihi al-maghrib whether it's from hadith or from his own authored works up until the time of maghrib aw rumma ma qara'a alayhi ba'd al-maghrib wa huwa yata'ashsha and then after that people would recite him after maghrib as well right up until the time where he's having dinner so he's still listening mm-hmm. to people wa kana la yara li ahadin dajar and he never pushed anyone away wa rubma tadarra'a fi nafsihi wa la yaqul li ahadin shay'a and sometimes it might have caused him discomfort having people always around him or it may have even been an inconvenience but he never refused anyone subhanallah so that's the that's that's some of the outstanding work that he had mm-hmm. right he it's also mentioned here that he made jihad along with his older brother and imad and others at the time that jerusalem was taken back during the time of uh, salahuddin al ayubi who took it taken over egypt so he was also a decorated mujahid the sharh on the al umda fil fiqh that was written with his cousin bahauddin al-maqtasi uh this sharh was written during the period of jihad against the crusaders mm-hmm. and there are two transmissions of that sharh one is held in qatar and one is held in egypt oh. but so al-um al-udda sharh al-umda by bahauddin al-maqtasi who died 624 was written and so he's one of the that is the authoritative understanding of how you grasp al-umda mashallah that's the authoritative and, right and it is written whilst they were fighting that's correct it was written on the way and all the way up so on the way to riding there mm-hmm. and then during that time as well subhanallah it was written so this is extremely this is an extremely important time right so when he when he comes back from there and he's established he lives the rest of his life in pretty much goodness mm-hmm. and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him up until he breathed his last which was on saturday on the day of eid al-fitr mm-hmm. in the year 620 hijri at his house in damascus and he was prayed upon that very day and they carried his body to jebel qasyun and they buried him at the foot of the mountain mm-hmm. and he's buried there and there was a huge a janaza procession and lots of people that were there that came to see his janaza now it's mentioned of this time period a narrative from ismail ibn hamad the writer or the scribe the baghdad scribe he said qala رايت ليلى عيد الفطر كان مصطفى عثمان قد قد رفع من جامع دمشق للسماء فلحقني غم شديد فتوفي الموافق يوم عيد he said i saw a dream on the night of eid al-fitr that the mushaf of uthman was being lifted from the central masjid of damascus towards the sky and i was overtaken by great sorrow 
And then later, after I woke up, I found out that Mwafu Mwakwadama had died on the day. Oh, then you had another narrative from Ahmed ibn Sa'ad, the brother of Muhammad ibn Sa'ad, the scribe of Jerusalem. Again, Ahmed had them in the He was one of the pious ones. قال رأيت ليلة العيد ملائكة ينزلون من السماء جملة وقائل يقول أنزلوا بالنوبة فقلت ما هذا قالوا ينقلون روح الموافقة الطيبة في الجسد الطيب so he narrates that he saw a dream in which the angels descended from the sky in a big throng and one of them said come down with the nuba and he said what's the nuba and the angel said it's the moving of the soul of Muafiqudin Qudama, the good one, from his from his noble body. We have another narrative from Abdul Rahman ibn Muhammad al Alawi, who said, "Raitu kaan al Nabiya sallallahu alaihi wasallam amat, wa qabro wa 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 qabro bi qasiyun yom Eid al Fitr." Abdul Rahman ibn Muhammad al Alawi said, "I saw a dream that looked like." a procession from the death of the Prophet ﷺ. Then I saw another grave at Mount Qasiyun on the day of Eid al-Fitr. Hilal, And we were at the mountain of Bani Hilal. And we saw a huge light coming from <laughs> Jabal Qasiyun on the night of Eid. We thought that Damascus was on fire. Hmm. And the people of the local village that were looking came out and looked. And that's when the news came that Muafim ibn Qadama had died. And he was buried at the foot of Jabal Qasiyun. As-Sibt ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah. He says, Muafim ibn Qadama had children whose names were Abu al-Fadl Muhammad, Abu al-Iz Yahya. So there's Abu al-Fadl Muhammad, another named Abu al-Iz Yahya, another named Abu al-Majd Isa. Matu kulluhum fi hayati, but all of them died in the lifetime of one from the Quran. Isa. And none of them reached adulthood other than Isa. Allah. وكان من الصالحين but Isa was from the Salihin وله بنات he also had daughters قال ولم يعقب من ولد موافق سوى عيسى and none of the children of Muafim al Qadama had children after خلفا ولدين الصالحين ومات وانقطع عقبه however except for Isa so he left behind two sons who were pious but those two sons died and that was the end of his lineage قلت وأما أبو الفضل محمد as for أبو الفضل محمد فولد في في ربيع الآخر he was born in ربيع الآخر سنة ثلاث وخمسين وخمسمية he was born in the year five five three وكان شابا ظريفا فقيها he was young he was a فقيه and he was knowledgeable تفقه على والده he learned from his father سافر البغداد he traveled to Baghdad and he also studied ikhtilaf and fiqh with al-fakhr Ismail wa sami al-hadith. And he also listened to hadith, Tufiya fi Jumad al-Ula sana tisa wa tisa'ina wa khamsamiya. But he wound up dying in Jumad al-Ula in the year 599 in a place called Hamdan. And he lived till 26 years of age, rahimahullah. As for Abu al-Majd Isa, he was actually given a laqab Majduddin. Tafaqa wa sami al hadith al kithir bi Dimashq min jama'atin kithiratin min ahliha. He studied fiqh and listened to had many hadith in Damascus from a large body of scholars. Wa min al waridina aliha wa sami bi Masr min Ismail ibn Yasin. And he was among those who was listened to on a regular basis. He also went to Egypt and listened to Ismail ibn Yasin, wal Busiri. And Al Busiri, Wal Artahi, and Artahi, or Fatima bin Sa'ad al Khair, and Fatima bin Sa'ad al Khair, or him and others besides, and also narrated Hadith himself. Zakar Humun and 
Al-Mundhi mentions in Muqala, Wali al-Khitaba wal-Imama bil-Jami al-Mudhafri bil-Safh al-Qasyun, Qala wa ishtamat ma'ahu bi Dimashq wa sam'atum minhu min walidi. So, he used to write regular addresses in khutbas. He was Imam at al-Jami al-Mudhafri, which was at the base of Mount Qasyun. And he used to have a regular gathering there, Damascus, and he also listened to and learned hadith from his father. He died on the fifth of Jumad al Akhir, or Sajisi, or the sixth, Sana Khams Ashar was Sitamiya, on the year 615 Hijri. So these were the people that died of his children. And then we also have mention being made of a Sibt ibn al-Jawzi of his karramat, mm-hmm. of his karramat. وقال Sibt ibn al-Jawzi, حكى أبو عبد الله بن الفضل العتاكي قال قلت في نفسي لو كان لي قدرة لبنية للموفق مدرسة. It was mentioned by Abu Abdullah ibn Fadl al-Ataki. He said, I said to myself one day, if I was able, I would build a madrasa for Muafiq al Qudama. وَأَعْطَيْتُهُ كُلُّ يَوْمًا أَلْفِ دِرْهَمْ And I would give him a thousand dirham every day. قَالَ فَجِئْتُ بَعْدَ أَيَّامٍ فَسَلَمْتُ عَلَيْهِ فَنَظَرَ يَلِيَّ وَتَبَسَّمْ He said, if I was able to do it, I would. So I came to him one day after a little while and I gave him salam. He returned salam to me. He then looked at me and smiled. وقال, he looked at me after smiling and said, when the man intends something, it's written for him as reward, even if he can't do it. Awesome. What that means is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala somehow gave him knowledge Allah. of what he'd been saying, even though he only said it himself. Hmm. قال كنت أبغض الحنابل لما شنع عليه من سوء الاعتقاد فمرضت مرضا شنغ الأعضاء وأقمت سبع 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 عشر يوما ولا أتحرك. Then you have a narrative from Abu Hassan bin Hamdan al Jarahi, who said, "I used to hate the Hanbalis because of what the rumors had been said about them about having bad creed, and one day because of that hatred, I became extremely ill where I lost use of my where I lost the use of my limbs, and I was ill for seventeen days and I couldn't move. But the manent al mot, so I wished for death. However." After Isha, Mu'afiq al-Qudim al-Qudama, Mu'afiq al-Qudim al-Qudama came to me. وَقَرَأَ عَلَيَّ آيَاتِ وَقَالَ وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءُ لِلنَّاسِ وَرَحْمَةُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And he recited to me, we sent down the Qur'an to be a cure for people and a mercy for the believers. وَمَسَ عَلَى ظَهْرِي فَأَحْسَنْتُ بِالْعَافِيَ And he touched my back all over, and all of a sudden, I perceived that I was healed. And I was healed. وقام. And I, then he stood up to go. فَقُلْتُ يَا جَارِيَ افْتَحِي لِي بَابِ And I said after that point, I said to the servant girl in the house, open the door for me. فَقَالَ أَنَا رُوحْ مَنْ حَيْثُ جَيْتْ وَغَابَ عَنْ عَيْنِي فَقُمْتُ مِنْ سَاعَةِ إِلَى بَيْتِ الْوُضُوء فَلَمْ أَصْبَحَتُ دَخَلْتُ الْجَامِعَ وَصَلَيْتُ الْفَجِرْ خَلْفَ الْمُوَافِقْ وَصَفَحَتَهُ so he got up, he told his servant girl to open the door, and she said, I'm going from the same place you came. So just when Muaf al Qudama had gone out, he said, I got up from that very hour, and I went to the place to make wudu. When morning came, I went into the central masjid, and I prayed Fajr behind Muaf al Qudama. After that, I shook his hand. He took hold of my hand and said, make sure you don't say anything about what happened to anybody. He said, but I'll say, I'll do, I'll do it, I'll do it. Meaning I'm going to do it anyway. Right. So he said that many people at the central masjid, masjid, they heard about this. And many doors of knowledge were open to them that had been locked 
and the truth was displayed to them. Oh. So these type of signs, there's also other other karamat that are mentioned of him walking on water of Lake Tiberias from one side to the other, right? So these are all mm -hmm. things about his life oh. that indicate the rank of this particular imam from his beginning in 541 to his end, 620 Hijri. Oh, and what, what, that should, what that should establish for us is it should establish for us this is what scholarship looks like. This is what the people that expend their life look like, because we should think about that, you know, especially like myself, I come from a refugee family. Mm -hmm. And so I think about that because someone might think, well, if you come from a refugee family, you know, what can you do? You know, you're coming from a war-torn country and you've suffered and you're traumatized. Maybe, mm -hmm. but that doesn't have to be the full story. Because they were traumatized when they first arrived in Damascus. There was, oh. they had, they had typhus. A lot of them had typhus. Oh, and Abu Umar al-Muqtasi, like he had many wives because so many of his wives died. Mm. So he would get married again oh, and that wife would die. And, and, and he, it's through his line that the Ibn Qudama lineage carries on. Oh. And then they, then they become the Ibn Abdul Hadi. Through that line, that's that's how they carry on through that. Through Abu Umar, you just said. Yes. Okay. That's where the lineage continues through Abu Umar mm -hmm. So then, then they then they become the Ibn Abdul Hadi through through another through another tree, and they carry on. Oh, right? So this, so so being a refugee, and going through the unsufferable trials and terrors and horrors of traveling from your native land to a new foreign place, that doesn't have to be the end of your story. It can be a new beginning. And the suffering mm -hmm. that you're having doesn't have to be your life story. Mm -hmm. It can just be part of your story. Because for, for them to have to have their dad wrap them up in sacks and sneak them out like they were bags of rice to keep them from being killed, that's huge. You had in a sack, Mu'afuddin Qudama and Liyauddin al-Maqtasi and Imaduddin, three of the most important people in fiqh, imagine what the ummah would have lost out on Allah. had they not been preserved. Especially for Abdul Ghalim and Abdul Wahid al Maqdisi's takhrij on the narrators of the Siha, the writing of Al Mughni. I mean, this is, this is massive. The comparative usul of fiqh that triggered a whole new world of comparative uh, discussion in usul of fiqh triggered a whole new discussion about because that started a whole discussion about comparative with pseudo film. What would have happened? Well, all of these things came from the refugee experience. And you also have to remember what they did when they came to Damascus. They're, they're relocating because you have to remember these were primarily farmers mm -hmm. and shepherds. So when they left, they didn't just leave alone. They brought their cattle with them. They brought their sheep with them. That was a massive disruption to Damascus. Wow. So what did they do? They asked for an empty plot of land to do what? To not disrupt people. Mm -hmm. Because the Damascenes are glad to, they're glad to host them and to look after, you know, alhamdulillah, we're glad you're here, everything else. But still, it's a big strain on the city. It's a big strain on the land. That many people coming. So... They asked for that plot of land, which they purchased, and began to create that district for themselves. And that district came to be known for the Palestinians that were refugees, that they went there. So when people would show up as Palestinian refugees, they would tell them, go there, go there. To do what? Well, to know where your people were. Mm -hmm. to look after the refugees because it's not the Damascene people's responsibility. If they did this, good, but it's not their responsibility. And then also to not make yourself a nuisance to the Damascene people because they have their own obligations and their own issues. Mm -hmm. So they really thought it out, especially laying out their own masjid and measuring the Salah times. And, you know, they really went to a lot of effort to try to create something where they gave back to Damascus. Mm -hmm. They didn't just take from Damascus. 
they gave back. We realize that we're foreign to here. We realize that. But we're going to invest in Damascus. We're going to take this little plot of land and we're going to do something with it. And subhanAllah, boy, did they. You know, 900 years later, we see, look at the investment they gave to Sham. You know, you have Taqid and Taymiyyah saying that, you know, that there's been no greater scholar that's ever entered Sham after al Zari than him. al Zari is from the time of Imam Abu Hanifa. That's a huge thing to say. And it also establishes that Muhammad al Qalam was greater than him. But that's the discussion. But the fact of the matter is, it shows the, the grandeur of these people and what they established in their efforts. And those efforts aren't, and aren't for naught. The effort that they expended, the taqwa that they showed, is what wasn't wasted. And it makes you realize that when they made hijra, because their land was turned into Darul 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 Harb, it got turned into Darul mm-hmm. Harb. So when they made hijra, they made hijra. The reasons they made hijra was for a dini reason, and they didn't they didn't make hijra to just anywhere. They tried to get to the closest part of Darul Islam they could. Then once they got there, they they had to process the shock of what happened to them. You know, I mean, Muhammad Qadam, rahimahullah, he's 10 years old and he had to uproot his entire life. But he still finished the Quran the next year. Allah. He still, he still fin- so that means he was still carrying on his studies. He still mm-hmm. had to carry on. Oh, no, the, the boys are traumatized. Or the kids are traumatized. Mm-hmm. Give them a year off. No, no, no. They should be kept as busy as possible because the less they have time to think about and go through those things, right. the better it is to keep them busy. Indeed. Sometimes you do something where you tell, let him just sit down and process it. Well, okay, well, then he sits down and he really, then he processes it too much and he can't digest it and then he falls apart. Just like when people retire, when they retire, they just sit down and then they kind of just wither mm-hmm. away. That's not good. If you're going to retire, you need to have a structure to keep yourself busy. Otherwise, you just waste away. Yes. So the, the time that Imam Waifu Din Qadam, Rahimahullah, living from 541 to 620 Hijri, he used his time wisely. Mashallah. He used his time wisely. And many people ha- have had more time than him that didn't use their time wisely. He lived for 79 years. Mashallah. And look at all of what he got done. And the Imam did not waste his time sitting in the masjid and debating with all of the common people. No, no, this, this was not what he did. He was, he was looking after their needs and caring mm-hmm. for the poor and indigent. Um, he was, if he wasn't reading hadith to people or having hadith read to him, they were reading kutub to him or reading kutub to him that he mm-hmm. had authored. Right. That's so, so he was doing these sama'at and other things like that. He kept himself engaged in good activities to keep himself busy and other people busy and good. And isn't that a sign for people of today? When you read and look into these biographies, you can see that these people did not waste a minute of their life. And yet they have achieved these great ranks. But the people today who are sitting on these uh, on, on social media and wasting their time. They do not achieve anything near what these imams have achieved. No, they, they don't achieve anything. And what, what happens is they don't even achieve their own aspirations. And often you'll hear these people say, I don't understand why. I want to do more, but the day just flies by. Flies by. Does it though? If you tell them, listen, sit down and write out a schedule. Go buy a day planner. All right. Grab a pen, buy a pen as well, and literally write down your day's activities as they're happening. Don't, don't even look back at it. Just write down for a week from Sunday to Saturday, day one to day mm-hmm. seven. The following Sunday, look over your week and look at what happened. And say, oh, subhanAllah. You, then, then you realize how many gaps that, man, I spent three hours doing that. I spent two hours doing this. I spent five hours doing that. How did I lose all that time? Then you start to realize time's not flying by. Mm -hmm. You're kind of letting it go. 
just as, just as much as if you have somebody who, if you've ever had a slow puncture in your car tire, it's not that time's flying by on your tire. It's, you got a slow puncture. Mm-hmm. And over time, now, over time, you can hear it when you, when you turn your car off, that slow sound of air leaving your tire. But then you, you're angry that Monday when you come out and the tire's completely flat. Hmm. Well, you had all week. All week you were thinking, ooh, that looks kind of flat. But I better get on with, yeah, I better get to work or I better do this or I better go play that or I better go. You kept leaving it and leaving it. Now it's Monday and you need to be somewhere. It's completely flat. And that's what's going to happen to some slaves of Allah. It's like they're going to be flat, Yom al in, in terms of that qiyas. That's like they'll be like that. They'll be like, oh, man, now it's, well, now you want to go back and fix things. Well, you mm-hmm. can't now. Because all that time you were seeing that, that time running out. And you were being shown signs, signs like sunsets, sunrises. You're like, ooh, it's, you know, we're losing time here. But some people get deceived by that because they see the sunset sunrise they're thinking well you know instead of thinking man i don't have much time i better you know start thinking about what i want to do with my life and start making moves rather than that they start thinking well the universe is eternal and when i die there is no life to come and there ain't no god and all this stuff it's like you you've completely misunderstood the whole point of this creation completely misunderstood Mm -hmm. And those people are those people suffer the greatest because their life is filled with all these regrets and stuff that they wish they could have done and should have done and might have done. But instead, look at all of what happened, what he got done. Mm-hmm. And I said when I wrote his biography, the first time I wrote Imam Wa Qudam Allah's biography, I said, although he didn't leave behind any children, maybe by following what's in his books and keeping his legacy going maybe we kind of become like his children if we follow it Mm -hmm. carry out his legacy stand by his guidance and act upon what he acted upon inshallah we'll become like his children Mm -hmm. and we'll dedicate some rewards so whenever we do khatams inshallah he usually gets a portion of the khat and we leave aside some of it for him for our, our other teachers we leave behind some for them because they they left a massive footprint mm-hmm. and 900 years the footprint that he left is still felt it's still felt today in usul fiqh and hadith transmission and fiqh and the i'tiqad like his footprint is still felt it's, it's still felt there was one thing that you mentioned prior i just wanted to ask this for clarification um since you said that the children of imam al-qudam did not survive you did mention that uh, Majid, Majid Din Isa that mm-hmm. have daughters, but they also survive. Yes. So, Allah, he had daughters, but the tabaqat doesn't mention their names. But okay. none of the children that he had outlived him. All right. Now, Majid Din Isa reached adulthood, but did not live him. Mm. Right. So all of us, so all of his children, most of them died in their early ages, other than two, one of which was Abu Isa, mm-hmm. who died in his twenties, but none of them outlived him. Okay. So, so he buried all of his own children. Oh, um, just there's there were a few things that I wanted to ask you since we discussed the life of the Imam. You also mentioned that uh, the Imam he assumed imamship of the Jami al Mudaffari. Now, what mm-hmm. does this actually exa- what does this exactly mean? Well, he would have been in charge of the khutbas. He would have been in charge of doing the nikah, the circumcisions. He would have been in charge of assuming the role regarding the salah, measuring the salah timings, these other affairs that have to do with running mm. the masjid and the imamship, the imamship there. Right. Whatever classes there would have been when students graduate, he's responsible for checking their um their tahqiq and tadqiq and hadith mm. so teaching them the salihia structure and one of the salihia program structures at that time was the khiraqi whatever his books that he'd written the tafsir of uh, al-baghwi 
because his elder brother had written out this tefsir so many times, Bahawi was was used. Um, and then also the I'tiqad of Imam Ahmed and whatever kutub that he had written and others had written. These were some of the mm -hmm. core things that were taught there that he would oversee. Because even khat handwriting, that like writing out and transmitting texts, naqal, is a is a it's not a separate science, but it's within the amal of ta'lim mm -hmm. as well. Because naqal is important. Naqal is not only transmitting the text, but transmitting the text with the correct understanding that was intended by the writer. And most people in the English speaking world, even when they're quoting a book, you can't take it from them. Uh -huh. because, because they're not doing naqal. They might be trying like they might be transmitting like the words are correct. Mm -hmm. But the understanding of what those words is wrong, so you can't take it from them. Oh. Just like their Quran. That's that's why Muhammad ibn Sirin, so like people of innovation will come and try to recite Quran to him. He wouldn't even listen to their Quran oh. because of the issue of naqal. Wow. Yeah, the Quran is correct. Yeah, you're reciting Hafsan Asim or Qalun or whatever. Yeah, that's correct. But no, mm -hmm. because the naqal is wrong. Right. So we can't even accept like the naqal and the aqal that has to be. Both of those are going to be correct. Mm -hmm. And in order to do naql, you have to transmit the text accurately, which, you know, an an Abi Hurayrata, radi Allahu anhu, an an Nabiyyi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama annahu qal, right? Like that is an example of naql, right? So an Abi Hurayrata. So you don't say Abu Hurayrata because the an is, the, the an coming before is harf jar. And what's coming after is majroor. And you're not going to say Abu Hurairah Tin, because Abu Hurairah Ta, oh, no. right? So this is this is dubbed, and dubbed is part of transmitting, it's part of naql. So, wow. so that's part of it too. Radiallahu anhu, right? Or when it's Aisha radiallahu anha, mm -hmm. saying radiallahu anhu for her is bad naql, so we can't take it. So, wow. Right? An al Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam anhu qal, or somebody transmits a hadith, right? but attributes it to the wrong Sahabi. That's wrong. We can't take that. Mm -hmm. The Hadith is correct, mm -hmm. but you attributed it to the wrong Sahabi. So we can't take that as knuckle. Mm -hmm. You can't cite it, can't take it as proof, nothing. And that's a common problem in the English speaking world. Mm -hmm. So because of improper knuckle, mm -hmm. you can't take from like most of those people in the English speaking world. Mm -hmm. And the time it would take, you know, to explain to some brothers, you know, brothers that are, that are, that are students, it's, it's easy enough. But like people on the street, they'll sometimes, you know, brothers mm -hmm. that I don't know will send me emails and things like that. And sometimes I can't answer the email because I'd have to get into the stuff of knuckle and be like, this is why I don't listen to any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was I was listening to this. I was listening to that. I said, no, you shouldn't even be listening to that. Mm -hmm. But the time it would take me to go into all that <laughs> stuff. I say, you know what? It's probably better that I just remain silent. Right. Because the issue of naql. Oh. So transmitting correctly is not just transmitting the text accurately. It's transmitting the understanding of the text. And it's, it, it made me angry because it's like, Sheikh Fadis ibn Fal has had to do that. Mm. He's had to actually explain that to one or, one or two brothers. Like he's had to go into like, you know, it's not just enough reading the Luma. You have to transmit it the way that it was intended by the author and the fact that he had to actually kind of dumb himself down wow. and explain this in detail to people. It's like, man, the shit, man. See, if that, if, if I'd been around him, I'd be, no shit, I'm not gonna let you do that. Oh. Let, let me, I'll take care of him. You, you don't do that. Mm -hmm. I would have literally interfered and been mm -hmm. like, no, nah, you don't do that. You don't, you don't answer online stuff. No, oh. I will filter the online stuff. Because it's just like, this is wasting time. I'm going to filter it. Wow. Because that's how I was with my teachers. You know, people would want to mm -hmm. send them emails. Oh, no, no, no. We're going to shift. No, we're going to filter it. We're not going to let people waste Muhammad Hassan al Shankrita Didaw. We're not going to let them waste his time. Mm -hmm. We're going to filter it. Because this is stuff that you should have been listening when he was teaching you, or you should have learned it already, or we'll explain it to you and break it down to you. But the sheikh shouldn't have to be doing this. He should be worried about the act of knuckle, not explaining the knuckle to you. Mm -hmm. It's like so someone's going through the Quran and they're teaching you the qira. 
they're teaching you uh, Huff's and awesome, mm -hmm. but they've also got to teach you Tejweed as well. Well, wait a minute. You should have, if you're in finishing school, you should have already known that before you got there. It's, it's, it's different if he's teaching you Tejweed and Quran. That's different. Mm -hmm. But if you're in finishing school where you're already supposed to have that, that's a major climb down where he's supposed to be just listening to your adzat and taking out mistakes. Right. Like there's some sheikhs you go to where they listen. Their, their thing is, I'm not going to teach you um, in Murrijal or whatever else. You come to me to recite the book to me to make sure it's correct. I check your understanding. Mm -hmm. And when I'm happy with your understanding, I say, okay, go teach people now. Because now that's naqal. Okay, now you go teach people. Mm -hmm. there's, there's teachers like that, that that's what they do. That's what they do. Then there's other teachers who are at the beginning of that process where they get you through your tejweed, they get you through that stuff, they get you through that. Mm -hmm. That's fine. There's some teachers who do both, right? They can do both depending, and, and they have different ranks and qualifications and so on and so forth, right? There's different teachers that can do both. Some do only one, some do only the second. But the point of why I'm saying all this is much of what's happening right now, especially when it's online, you can't take anyway, even if it's correct, because there's no knuckle. They're not, they're, they might be reciting the ayat correct, they might be, but they're not conveying the sense that was intended by the writer. Could you please give us an example of this here? Okay. Um, it's a very common one that happened. Um, there is a statement in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari that Abdullah Mas'ud is purported to have said, we said, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi in the time of the Prophet But after he died, we say, As-salamu ala nabi Okay? Yes. All right. Some indigent slave of Allah, some miskeen, 40 years ago, took that statement, literally, took it as a proof that the tashahud should not be recited as as-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi, but instead should only be as-salam ala nabi, that portion. Mm -hmm. Then that book, some miskeen, more miskeen than him, translated in English and spread oh. So it's not enough that people were poisoned in Arabic in my time. But then I saw it crop up in English. I'm like, what's this doing here? And it poisoned people again. Now, let's look at this. First of all, Abdullah, okay, I'll, I'll go the other direction. First of all, in the Muwatta, Omar radiallahu anhu, who's transmitting the, the tashahud, He's discussing it on the mimbar in Masjid al mm -hmm. And he says at the second portion of it, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. This is during his khilafah. The Rasul wasalam, he's died. It's during his khilafah. The whole masjid hears it. Had it been wrong, they would have corrected it. Mm. But they didn't. Ibn Abbas, when he's teaching the tashahud, Teaches the tashahud, and when he gets to the second part, he says, As-salamu alayka, ayyuhan nabi. In the tashahud of Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa takes his hand and forms his fingers into the tashahud form and teaches the tashahud, including the portion of As-salamu alayka, ayyuhan nabi. In addition to that, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he sent, he, he's, he's the one that's purported to have made that statement. He sent to Iraq, to Al-Kufa to teach. When he's teaching, he has large bodies of students. And the transmission of the tashahud in Al-Kufa is, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. The same things transmitted from Al-Qama, Al-Aswad, it gets to Ibrahim al nakhai which also goes to Hamad ibn Salama, who teaches Imam Abu Hanifa, who transmits, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. Everybody's clear in all the books of whichever madhab that the second portion is, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. Mm -hmm. 
yes. and to knowingly delete a portion or leave off something of the acceptable transmissions of the Tashahud, whichever of the ones of the four transmissions there are, to intentionally leave that off, you do have to do sahu for it. Mm-hmm. If you don't, with well, purposeful intent, the law will be nullified. This individual did that and has made thousands of people think that assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi needs to be deleted. Mm-hmm. This is improper naql. That's not what Al Bukhari, who when Imam Ahmed was discussing the tashahud with him, taught him assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. He's the one who's transmitting this state. No one in the ummah practices upon that statement in Bukhari. No one. This is an example of improper naql. You cited the text correctly. That's from a Bukhari. It's correct. Yes. But that's not what was intended. And we can do so by looking at history, ijma, all the other texts. So we can't take from you that wow. statement. And we can't take from you. Because if you've improperly narrated that, what else have you improperly given naql to? Mm-hmm. This is why this is so important. Because people... Tra- people People cite things, but the citation is improper because it's not what the author intended. If it's not what the person that gave you the text intended, we can't take it from you. We just, we just can't. So from these innovators or these miskeen people, we can't take Bukhari or Muslim. From, let's mm. say they even have a Senate. We can't take it because it wasn't, it's like it was never transmitted. Wow. It's like it was never recited because it was transmitted other than the way in which it was intended by the one that gave it in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's improper. And that's not only for that, but it's for a large body of Mm -hmm. other things that we find in English that we can't accept in print, online, these YouTube videos, sometimes they're saying some stuff in YouTube and I just turn it off. I have to turn it off. Mm-hmm. The stuff comes up in my feed and they'll just start playing. Yeah, too much. And I'll be I'll be typing or doing some review or something like this and something will come up. I'll be, okay, I can't listen to this mm-hmm. because it's not what was intended. When you're transmitting something, you have to transmit not the, just the accuracy of the words, but you have to transmit it according to what was intended. That's why there's that section in the Luma. And we return knowledge of it to the one that said it and the responsibility of knowing it to the one who's responsible. That's the context. So what you're doing is what was intended. Or remember Shafi's statement. I believe in Allah according to what Allah has given, according to what Allah intended. And I believe in the Messenger of Allah and what came from the Messenger of Allah according to what he intended. It's not that's called that's naqal. That's naqal. <laughs> and and transmitting that is a trust and it's is something that has to be done properly. And it's not being done in big spheres in the English speaking world because. And, and, and that's one of the evidences of, of charlatanism. Wow. And, and it j- just as much, I'll give you any, how, how, how blatantly obvious it is mm-hmm. for a student of knowledge when this happens, the, ba- the bad knuckle. I'll give you a blatant obvious. Mm-hmm. Someone comes to Brother Iskander's house, okay? And uh, you need your roof res- sorted out. And what he does is he builds the scaffolding improperly. Then he goes on the roof of your house, and let's say the roof of your house, uh, he's replacing it with chipboard. Mm-hmm. Why is he replacing your roof with chipboard? Mm-hmm. And he doesn't put any tiles on it as well. Mm-hmm. And says, well, yeah. there you go. And you can see, like, when the sun is shining, you can see mm-hmm. light is coming in. Right? To you, that's blatantly obvious. Yes. That's blatantly obvious that this person 
no matter how confident he looks yes <laughs> no matter how no matter how confident he's he is when he's talking to you and he's filling out the invoice and he's smiling and grinning and everything else irre- that's irrelevant right that this person is blatantly obvious that this person is not a roofer mm-hmm. it's blatantly obvious yes just as much as when somebody does something like that in knuckle it's blatantly obvious that person has student knowledge it's blatantly mm-hmm. obvious right so that that's why you know when when people started talking uh you recently asked me about those 41 statements that i translated i translated from Sheikh Mustafa Hamdur Alayan because somebody has said oh there's there's no books that right. are from the first three generations about right. creed now that's another example where you couldn't take from a person that said that subhanallah because that's bad knuckle. He might be transmitting all the good stuff, but you are not transmitting what was intended hmm. by the people that get, you're not transmitting what's intended or people that transmit Taqidun Taymiya like his books, but they read into it other than what was intended. Yes. Like, you know, the author of Keshfe Shubit Fitrheed, uh, that, that text and the one who wrote those other 22 pamphlets you just that you can't take any citations mm-hmm. that's why if you look in the divine lightning Sheikh Suleiman would do what he'd recite it so so first he'd cite what was said by his brother and then he'd cite the entire passage mm-hmm. again oh. why because you can't take it from him oh. so he would recite go back and look at that book he recites the he cites the entire passage again so so he doesn't just cite the snippet that was mis mis cited he cites the snippet in context but he cites it again as if it hadn't been cited the second time because of the issue of knuckle that's how serious this is so when you see this happening and people improperly citing text you know it's not just when the guy cites a hadith and he says ali ibn abu talib it's like, okay, you can't take hadith from that person. Because it's not Ali ibn Abu Talib. Mm-hmm. It's Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because the, the majroor in that hadith, this, this, when it's ibn, so the first time you have like Ali yun, that's marfu'a. Ibn, then what comes after is going to be majroor. It's always going to be in, 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 in. So Abi, Abu is going to be Abi. It's going to be Majroor. Ali ibn Abi Talibin. Ibn Abdi Manaf, right? It's going to be like that. Mm-hmm. So when someone's not doing the that stuff, it's like, okay, you can't take from this person. The knuckle is, this person doesn't know how to do knuckle because they're not transmitting. And I'm not talking about a stumble because anybody can stumble when you read. I'm talking about transmitting that as a regular amal. Mm-hmm. You can't and take that. How about... When you go to a particular Samar session where they just read Kutub of a Hadith, this is just merely reading. Well, that depends. If somebody is doing a Makara mm-hmm. where they're reading the book just to do Ihya of the book, because sometimes people will go in a gathering and they'll read the book to do Ihya of it to keep it alive in the hearts of people. Mm-hmm. Right, the Ihya of the book. Like, okay. so, they'll, so there'll be Makaras where they'll uh, read Bukhari. They won't do the Sharh. They'll just be mm-hmm. reading the yes. hadith for the barakah where they're listening to maqara. This is fine. This is acceptable. Mm-hmm. Right? But provided that you're reading it with the right naql, so you're transmitting the words correctly, the right dabd, right? So it's, you know, an abdillah ibn mas'udin, radiallahu anhu, right? You're reading, you're reading it according to the dabd and everything else with diqa and hiqa and stuff like that. That's fine. But when you start talking about citing things, there's people that will cite a hadith outside of the sense in which it was meant, which disqualifies you <laughs> taking from what that person's saying and the context of that hadith. Because it's like, that's not the context that was intended. Mm-hmm. So you lose, you lose, it's, it's like losing information. It's, it's like if you poke holes in a bag so then when you pour water into that bag, water seeps out. Mm-hmm. It's like you're losing information because it's, been, it's being improperly cited. And, that's, and this, this issue is, is huge. Mm-hmm. It's huge. 